Today, I'm chatting with sea slug expert and co-founder of the Sea Slug Census, Professor Steve Smith. Hi, Steve. I've heard that sea slugs can act as indicator species. What is an indicator species? Okay, well, an indicator is an organism that tells you something about the health of your environment. And um, the reason we use sea slugs as indicators is because they have a couple of really important traits. One is they have very short life cycles, so they turn over very quickly, um, which means they'll only come back to a habitat if that habitat actually has the appropriate shelter, food, habitat, whatever. And so this makes them incredibly habitat dependent. So if there's a shift in the organisms living in an area that sea slugs are dependent on, you won't see those sea slugs. So potentially they can turn over really, really quickly and they can tell us something about um, health environment. So uh, on the east coast of Australia, for example, the big flooding events had a major impact on sea slug communities. So this is what we mean by an indicator, something which usually is quite easy to see and to count um, that tells us something about the health of the environment. So how old do they live then? What is the range of lifespan of sea slugs? It's um, months to, to a year. I think, I think they may, in captivity, they may have actually found sea slugs that live a little bit longer than that, where they haven't got the, um, the dangers of the natural environment. Uh, but generally speaking, most sea slugs live for less than a year. So that's a, that's a pretty quick turnover rate. Any diver will agree that sea slugs are some of the most interesting animals to see underwater when they're diving. And some of that is attributed to their really bright colors. So why do they have such bright colors? And one of the reasons they're so colorful is they feed on the sponges and they're able to sequester or store the toxic compounds associated with the sponges. Um, and they use those as defense. They secrete those onto their dorsal surface uh, as part of the slime. And then um, predators are completely put off trying to eat them. Sea slugs are absolutely stunning organisms. Um, you know, divers get hooked on those very easily. I always say that when divers first learn to dive, they they, first of all, they're focusing on their gear and making sure it's working and breathing. Then they see the fish and because they're swimming around, easy to see. And then they see the nudibranchs and a lot of divers don't move on. And particularly if they've got a camera because they're very easy to photograph. They don't move very fast. Um, and the results are colourful and stunning. So it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to find. And I don't know how many sensors I've been involved in now, but always find something, always find something interesting or new. If you were to provide some advice to a diver that's looking for some new nudies in an area or just wants to be able to find more nudibranchs when they're diving, do you have any tips or advice for it? All, well, it actually starts long before you go for the dive. It starts okay. by, by learning something about the habits of the different sea slugs and the ones that you're targeting. Um, people are usually very good at finding the colourful ones that sit out in the open. But it's about knowing where you might find them, what they might feed on, where particularly, say, you've got strong currents, you might find you've got a different type of um, benthic organism, so the habitat, um, and working out what species you might find there, what they might look like, and how you therefore go about looking for them. So that's the first thing, is learn something about your subject matter. And there are plenty of books, um, plenty of information online. Have a look at some of the images other people post and see if you can have a look at the sorts of habitats. Talk to people in the local area who are particularly keen on searching for nudibranchs or other sea slugs and, and um, see where they look. Um, but importantly, go slow. Go slow. Um, have a careful look. Use a light if you have access to a light because often that will actually just uh, pick up things that you can't see under that sort of reduced lighting that you've got underwater. It's not just divers, but um, some of the best finds we get around the Coffs Harbour area are actually in rock pools. You don't even have to get in the water. You can see them. And what you're looking for there is colour and movement, generally speaking. Are there any areas that seem to be like really productive when it comes to sea slugs? From my experience, I've always found that slightly more turbid waters um, where you've got, so you've got that suspended organic material, which means that things like sponges, hydrozoans, um, uh, bryozoans, a whole bunch of things, which is suspension feeders, can flourish. And if we've got our habitat, then we've got food uh, for sea slugs. So Steve, with the sea slug census, can you tell me about why you're interested in recording sea slugs? 
Why is this information important? Well, I think one of the things at the outset, what we're really interested in is how species distribution patterns um, are changing over time um, from the scale of your own backyard, your favourite dive site, right through to, you know, sort of across the continent. And so I think that one of the, the, one of the things, um, one of the themes that we really like to focus on in the sea slug census is uh, range extensions, which means finding sea slugs somewhere where they've never been found before. And generally speaking, that means climate change related range extension, so poleward, in other words, moving moving south. Probably the thing that, that motivates me most is looking for those range extensions uh, because that is a very obvious signal. As we said before, they're good indicators. It's a signal of a, a warming ocean. And uh, in the Coffs Harbour Sea Slug Census in 2022, uh, we had seven species which had never been found in the area before. And one of them um, had never been found in Australia before. The closest record was uh, New Caledonia. Prolonged heat heat waves um, can cause some time of type of temperate, uh, temperature shock, and you might lose some of the critical habitat which some of these species depend upon. So what you might see is shifts in community structure. You might see, let's use loss of kelp as an example. You lose kelp um, from an area, you're going to lose some of the species that depend on kelp and not all of those species feed on kelp um, quite often on kelp blades you get hydrozoans these little um, hydroids that, that grow over the surface and there's a whole bunch of species including one of my favorite um, Hancockia burni which depend on these habitats so you'll get the direct loss of um, food for the grazers that would, go, would feed on the habitat but you also get a loss of those species that um, depend on secondary components of that habitat. Um, so, you know, this is one of the things which um, I think the sea slug census will actually show us. If we've got good long-term data from a location like Nelson Bay, where this is the 33rd sea slug census we'll be doing there, um, if there's a broad scale shift in community structure, we'll be able to pick it up. So what happens with that data? Is it possible for people to check it out? Yeah, look, all of that data now is in the public realm. So if somebody finds something really cool and records it, they might um, find that all of a sudden their picture is um, on these global biodiversity information uh, networks um, on Atlas of Living Australia. And, and, you know, they've recorded something really significant, which is contributing dramatically to our knowledge about um biodiversity and its distribution in Australia. So tell me now why we're we interested in doing a sea slug census on the Great Southern Reef. Well, the Great Southern Reef is a really interesting animal because, you know, it's uh, defined, I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's sort of the area where we find these large macrophyte kelp type beds, um, which are in, in flux at the moment. Um, but you have so that high productivity, but it's also a massive area which covers biogeographic zones right across the country. Um, so we've got really, we know terrestrially speaking, for example, southwest um, Western Australia is, is really important for um, species which have evolved in that area. Um, and while we've got greater connectivity um, in the ocean environment, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if you find stuff there, which we haven't seen anywhere else before. So uh, I think probably the most important thing about the Great Southern Reef sea slug census is it's actually filling in the gaps between the locations where we've already got a lot of information from existing sea slug censuses. And it gives people who are keen to get involved but haven't been able to up until now um, the opportunity to contribute. So before we wrap up, Steve, uh, what would you like people to know about the sea slug census and how can they get involved? One of the things with uh, with the sea slug census, like I said, it's been an organic process of growth. Um, some people know about it, some don't. And um, just letting people know that there's an event and if there are photographers on board and they want to take pictures, um, they can actually contribute by submitting their images to iNaturalist and joining the project.